Greeks, a Greek and social philosopher, Konstantinos uh, Choukalas, who is a um, um, taught many years in Paris, um, was Nikos Poulantzas' best friend, as well as being a you know, first-rate author in his own right, especially on education and uh, social and political issues. Um, uh, he wrote this book in Greece in uh, 2000, in Greek in 2012, a few years before Syriza, you know, had come to power, even though Syriza, Synopsis Moss, which was a union of the left, a synthesis of many left groups uh, politically, which is now basically a liberal, uh, you know, machine. Uh, very disappointing to me. I should have brought this up in Stanley's uh, course earlier today, how disappointing this stuff really is. I mean, you know, in terms of that was the last moment, in my opinion, of real revolutionary upsurge, you know, in, in terms of at least the West, right, outside of, you know, the North American, Euro-American context, so he's uh, had the hope, but didn't fulfill it. And it's very sad to us who participated actively in that, and, you know, it demands a lot of leftist uh, mourning, if you will. Uh, again, Michael, is that once the again. new one? No. Um, so, um, anyway, Chukolas, uh, the author of this book, wrote this in 2012. He's been very uh, involved in trying to look at uh, the larger picture, uh, in terms of phases of capitalism and the effects that it has upon uh, everyday life and on the notion of the individual, whether or not this is even a, a term anymore. Worthy of consideration, we talked a little bit this, about this in the previous session in the foreign and philosophy. So we're going to be using this as a background uh, text, as the fundamental text, but we're also going to be reading, uh, I thought it would be a good idea, to go to the poem from which this book, this book was translated as Age of Anxiety. He did not intend it as a pun on Auden, but the English translators did, right? So uh, W.H. Auden, you know, post-World War II wrote The Age of Anxiety, which is an amazing okay. poem when you reread it. Um, this is set in a bar room a few blocks from here <laughs> and after World War II, and it's a conversation between you know, Quant, Embel, Rosetta, <laughs> Malin. I think there are four or five characters. And, in, 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 you know, I sit in one of the four characters, right? Yeah. Four, four characters, right? I sit in one of the dives on 52nd Street, well, that's uncertain and September afraid. September 1939. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad you're here, Chris. <laughs> Please, come sit here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'll it's do right. it. No, no. I'm sorry. I'm, 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 I'm done, you know, two in a row. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> anyway, so, yes, that's September 1st, 1939. But this is set in a bar room. This was written 45, 46. And, uh, you know, published and, you know, so the idea is to look at the poetic attempt to look at, you know, this age of anxiety that came in uh, and I'll race all this It's a stuff. quest or yes, a pilgrimage. It is a quest. Yes, right. It's interesting that he wrote The Age of Anxiety right after um, Eliot wrote The Wasteland. They're both take similar takes on modern life. Wasteland's much earlier, isn't it? Uh, about, yeah, 19, 1920s, 25? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wasteland is a response to World War I in some ways, or in well, between the war. Well, he had a breakdown. Yes, That's he had a breakdown. It right. was a response yeah. to his uh, emotional breakdown and his, I forget who he got treatment. He went to Switzerland to be Vince analyzed. Wagner? <laughs> I, I, don't, I have to look it up. Ludwig? Who, who actually was his Can analyst. Anyway, um, so um, yeah, so uh, the, the the Auden poem is forty five forty six, uh -huh. and Chukalas is writing two thousand twelve. A lot happened in the seventy year period, right? <laughs> so we're looking at, we're looking at, at different levels of anxiety. We have the anxiety of influence. Well, yeah, that's, that's enough. Okay, okay. What is the genre? Is it, okay. it's a multi genre? I, it, it looks like it's a poetry, a play, and no, it's, what is a, it? it's a dramatic poem. Oh, oh, okay. A quest. It's kind of like a mask. Like a what? Mask, which uh, is a kind of. Think early of four of us: story. Peter, Stanley, myself, and Josh sitting around in a bar, <laughs> the mask? and we're talking about what's <laughs> what's going on in our age. 
right? And we start to have a conversation about it. And then all this kind of poetic language oh, comes out, right, etc. And it plays on many of the uh, epic poems, you know, the seven sages, you know, remember the, the sections, each of the sections, right? Going it on. also uses, instead yeah. of the four humors that, that were, that existed in Renaissance poetry, we have Myers Briggs, I think, here. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So that I just we, have phlegm. You have <laughs> phlegm. I'm, I'm black bile. You're black bile? Okay. <laughs> the old Elizabethan humor. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, we're going to read a poem. We're also going to read Leonard Cohn. The future. <laughs> We're going to look at Leonard Cohn's uh, thing. Although I, I thought we should read, we should do Tower of Song alongside of that. Maybe you know, because I, I keep asking Hank Williams how lonely does it get, yeah. but he hasn't answered me yet. Yeah, that when I hear him, too. I hear him coughing all night long <laughs> on the 110th floor in the Tower of Song. But anyway, that might be more relevant than the future. Well, uh, that's you know, prophetic. Maybe. Yeah, it is prophetic. That's right, that's right, that's right. You mean I can't have my alienation and my anxiety alongside the oh, not prophetic? Unless you go see Harold, he'll okay, tell you okay. all that. Okay, okay. You have him as a professor? No, I, I wouldn't get along with him at all. That's good. I met him. <laughs> She's speaking about Harold Bloom, who was a very... Um, um, erudite and uh, extremely well-read uh, person, professor at NYU and at Yale, who was famous for a, a book called The Anxiety of Influence, in which his thesis is poetry moves in edible senses, right? There's a rival among poets. So you have poets killing poets, you know, through words. It was really a history. story about Yale at the time. Well, yes, I, I know all the dirt, <laughs> but uh, we, we don't have to, yeah. yeah. So, so anyway, uh, yeah, so uh, that, that's the reference there. But anyway, we're going to read that with the long side of uh, Leonard Cohn. Um, also, uh, we're going to read a very good book uh, by Mauricio Lazzarato, an Italian Marxist, called The Making of Indebted Man. Um, we did uh, that, didn't we? We did, we did here, but Peter never did it, so, you know, we'll let him do it. The Making yeah. of Indebted, indebted Man. Right, a very, very good thing. Lazzarato was a, a person who came out of the Italian section uh, directed by um, uh, Negre and, and somewhat Tronti, came out of that movement. He went to study with Gilles Deleuze uh, in the 70s and, uh, you know, has become a philosopher in his own right. I have uh, several yeah. of his books that yeah, I've gone Yeah, he's it's very good. Yeah, he's very good. Is that autonomia? Yeah. It's called uh, uh, Autonomia, yeah, yeah, Autonomia. What's yeah. his first name? Ma Maurizio. Oh, Maurizio. 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 And then we're going to begin, we're going to talk about uh, Escape from Freedom by Eric Fromm. We're going to read, read that, uh, that together uh, because of, uh, you know, in anxiety there's always this escape. And, and Fromm, in, his, in a way, is the, you know, I'm not reading him in the Freudian philosophy, but he's part of the humanistic you know, Freudian attempt and an attempted synthesis between Marx and Freud uh, in the 1950s, uh, especially, who's making a comeback now uh, for some people. Uh, those of you that have read uh, Eros and Civilization, the appendix is an attack on from uh, the neo-Freudianism, even though they were friends, and you know, it was a very interesting polemic. So, uh, but we're going to read the From, and then we'll finish with the Chukalots, which is seven chapters. This book is, uh, is it's only about a hundred and, uh, of text, uh, 120 pages or so, and the rest is footnotes, right? Yeah. So it's a, it's, it's a hundred, only 104 pages, and, um, uh, the poem itself is, uh, did you, what, did you pass around the book, the poem? Oh, yeah, good, okay, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, the poem is, is long, you know, it's an epic poem, but we're going to, you know, focus again, chapter, we're going to read the entire book here, uh, chapters one through four of uh, Escape from Freedom and From, the entirety of Making of Indebted Man, and uh, the entire poem, The Age of Anxiety. So again, we're going to try to look at this in the horizon of Atlantic hegemony, right? World War II, just to historicize a little bit, you know, when the United States is still the manufacturing giant of the world, 26% of the world's production is still in the U.S. post-World War II. That's down to about 9% today, 
Yeah, 26 percent. We produced over one quarter of the. Now we still consume over a quarter of the energy of the world, <laughs> mm. but we don't produce 25 percent. <laughs> now we're a service. Uh, yeah, we're a <laughs> service economy. <laughs> so anyway, we've gone through many, many changes here. I mean, in between here, uh, I, actually, the post uh, World War II moment is uh, R Richard Lettuce uh, uh, very accurately pointed out in psychoanalysis. The ego psychologists were there to treat wartime neurosis. You know, they were really about that. You know, uh, soldiers. Yeah, the soldiers. Yeah, wartime neuroses after after World War II. So you begin to see anxiety and trauma related together. You know, in the ego psychologist moment, as well as the new wave of immigration and the problems with cultural assimilation, the neo Freudian movement which again treated anxiety in terms of everyday coping mechanisms, everyday adaptability, not in terms of sexual either dysfunction or sexual inhibition, etc. And a crucial text that maybe we should have read here is Inhibitions, uh, Symptoms, and Anxiety of Freud, or the Theory of Infantile Sexuality. If you want background, but there's only so much time, you know, in the day or in these courses. But these are texts of Freud. Freud becomes assimilated, culturally assimilated, and the psychoanalytic theories of anxiety are very much displaced right into anxiety on the job. Right? Only the anxiety of relationship, relationship, where therapy became a client best based thing, then really a kind of <laughs> uncovering of tremendous repressed material and, and, and the ability to work with that in terms of some, some cre creativity, right? In, in many ways. I'm not saying it was all this way, but this was dominant. It became dominant during this period. So, so this ego psychology to treat the, the wartime neuroses, uh, the beginning of the, you know, the classification, the taking over of therapy by the medical uh, industrial complex, right? The birth of a new kind of pharmaceutical regime. All of these things are happening when Oz is writing his poem, right? <laughs> in many ways, right? That, um, yeah, please. A lot yeah, of people yeah. See in the age of anxiety, or a, a kind of the new theology that that Auden is working through. Yeah, I mean, we we can talk about that about his relationship and to to, a to kind this. Of Protestantism, yes, yes, a new know. Protestantism. Yeah, and at the same time, Eliot is writing yeah. his four quartets, which right. are also I religious. Just thought of that. Right. <laughs> Just, just thought it right. Would be no, no, it's interesting. Look at the yeah, yeah, two. sure. No, and the no, no I agree. After war, there seems to be a searching for spirituality. Right, and another thing too, that search for spirituality, you begin to see this in the Freudian field with Norman O. Brown, who is Protestant. Right, mm -hmm. life against death was the attempt to set Freud in a larger cultural framework, the mm -hmm. psychoanalytic meaning of history. So for you guys, I don't know, maybe you can introduce yourselves. Some of us know each other here. and Just tell us why you're here and, and a little bit about your background, if you don't mind. Yeah. Oh. Yes, okay. Yes. Um, my name is Desha Fabia. I'm here my president from my local union decided that it would be good if I open up my mind to more things. Good. So good. he yeah. followed me. I think he's, I don't know what he does, but he followed me that there were courses here and for me to choose one. He just said it. So good. Is he paying good. for it? I don't ever know. Oh, yes. well, I hope so. It's nice to nice to meet you. And, and you're in DC thirty seven? DC thirty seven. Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. You can't strike. No, yeah. not because of the tailor law. They yes. can strike. Well, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Matt. No, <laughs> I know you're under the auspices of the tailor law. See yes, what sir. happens in my place where we could strike, we didn't strike. Yeah. <laughs> we voted not to strike. How stupid we are in my university. But anyway, yeah. All right. Good. Okay. Well, pleased to have you, and hope. Uh, yeah, you have a little background in this kind of stuff, or is it just uh, kind of the 
it's all to me. It's all okay. Well, we'll try to keep you involved in a good way. Yeah, I'm sure you will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And please, I, I bet you we can. So yes, I'm Maureen. Um, I am an academic, but in computer science, so this is very new to me. Okay. Um, and I read about this in a newsletter and thought it sounded interesting. And decided okay, good. Good. And do you, do you, where do you teach? Uh, um, at the University of Maryland. In, in Baltimore. Or in, uh, in uh, College Park. In College Park, the big, the big one. Yeah. Okay, interesting. And we're bring, you live in New York? Uh, well, he, he lives in New York, and so I Oh, you saw the Acela run. Yes. I, I got you. Okay, cool. Okay, good. Okay. Well, pleased to have you then. Yeah. Do you teach theoretical courses on uh, on artificial intelligence I, and, and stuff like that? I teach um, okay. artificial intelligence. Okay. So like implementing it. Yeah, okay. So, well, let me just mention, I mean, you know, these being some of the stuff that we're throwing out here after World War II is the construction of the social sciences in the United yeah. States. And Norman Wiener, Lawrence Kuby was the psychoanalyst who they used, and this was all part of a kind of semi-conspiracy to keep social control mm -hmm. after World War II, mm -hmm. to make sure that the Cold War did not become really warm, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, uh, yeah, interesting, good. So that's, that's good to know, okay. Yeah, please, yeah. Um, I'm you live about, in New York, yeah. Well, sort of. Sort of. Uh, <laughs> so sometimes college park. Sometimes yeah. college park, yeah. I'm Al, I'm also an academic. I mean, we're basically the same person. Um, oh, my God. Oh, boy. This is the wrong place to be saying that. <laughs> Lack of individuality. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, okay, I'm also an academic in computer science. You have the right name, Hal, yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> But I'm on uh, like sabbatical leave of absence at a, there's a Microsoft research office here in New York, which is why I'm in New York. Okay, interesting. And you found out through the newsletter too, yeah. or through, you know. Technically, I found out. Yes, yeah, so I understand. <laughs> I understand. I just had to say it. Okay. Was it the yeah. left forum so, one or the institute one? Um, Do you remember? No, it actually wasn't either. It, it was, wasn't either of them. Yeah. Hmm, okay. Do you remember where it was? It was like um, one of these like things to do around New York. Oh, really? Like a section oh, on, like, any good. <laughs> 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 oh, so I dance in the dining room. Wow. <laughs> good to know. <laughs> okay. And yes, please, did you know, and then we'll introduce ourselves uh, yeah. quickly. Yeah. Um, my mm -hmm. name is Lewis. Yeah. I'm an assistant editor for a business journal. Um, I found out about this because my legal or illegal. <laughs> 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 uh, I found out my boyfriend um, sent me the information for this class because I'm like I also write fiction. Okay. And so I'm like kind of thinking through these similar okay. like ideas. Interesting. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. Good. Okay. So I guess I mean the rest of us know. I'm, so I'm Michael Pelius. I'll be co-teaching this with uh, Peter Bratzis and. Uh, and uh, I mean, you can just maybe just say your name so we know. Look at yeah, so, 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 so Jane Al, that's right. Thank you. Read it, Adam. Nice to meet you. George. George. That's Al reading the book. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's Chris, who's a troublemaker. And yeah, 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 no, but a good troublemaker. I like troublemakers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm Rachel. Nice I'm to meet you. Yeah. I'm Beth. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, well, we hope we, you know, we try to make it a, a good learning experience as, as well as try to have some fun on, you know, since it's Saturdays. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, speaking of which, yes, I mentioned, for those of you who no, don't know, I mean, I'm sure you've heard of Norman Wiener, right? The human use of human beings on cybernetics was very important for the development of the social sciences alongside a psychoanalyst named Lawrence Kuby and uh, others too were part of this program to construct you know what most people took up as sociology uh, you know in some senses anthropology uh, and and it translated into uh, psychoanalysis as well so you had Alongside of this this movement, you have the neo Freudian movement, right, and the continuation of ego psychology. And uh, as I said, the strengthening of the ego was always the moment of the ego psychologist, right? We're going to strengthen the egos of the soldiers that come back. We're going to strengthen the ego in terms of coping for the workplace. You know, you must be strong. 
be stoical, you know, these kind of moments, etc. So the ego psychology is, 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 is played out. The neo-Freudianism was really a dilution of libido theory um, um, and uh, certainly an attempt to culturally assimil assimilate. What we get, you know, is the term the melting pot. They participated in this kind of rhetoric, if you will, the melting pot itself. So Auden is writing under this in this horizon as well, right, in many ways. Now, when we jump forward to Chukolas, 2012, you know, a lot has transpired, you know. The United States has lost its position as the manufacturing giant of the world, as most of you know, by 1979, this is beginning to shift to China, now is there, as well as other places around the globe. Um, you know, um, um, the, 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 the um, um, uh, economy, no longer so much automobile, industrial steel, aluminum based, right, has basically been taken over by a whole new set of capital since you work at Microsoft, the, the so-called FANG economy that is now out there has created this enormous amount of new wealth, right, from Silicon Valley to Silicon Alley here in New York, and a very different type of thinking, you know, if you will, of which I think some people have aptly called, we now live in the screen culture. The new cave is the screen, right? Not only do we live in the cave with the Promethean light, <laughs> you know, being cast upon the wall, the old movie culture, the screen, right, of the movies, we're now doubly screened, <laughs> right? We're doubly taken away from reality, right? Or the real that's going on. Yes, I'm sorry. Is virtual reality? No, no problem. Yeah. Is, this, is this a new acronym of the FANG culture that replacing FANG with FANG? I'm, 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 I'm using I'm, it because uh, it's Netflix, Facebook, Google. Apple, Amazon, Facebook, sorry, Netflix. Two people were speaking, I'm okay. sorry. Facebook uh, for F, okay. right? Apple, uh, <laughs> Amazon, okay. Netflix, Okay. And think and of what the G is. Yeah, okay, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That, that was a new one on me. I had yeah, heard that. Yeah, okay. right, yeah, yeah. So, okay. yeah, the Fang economy. Yeah. Okay. This is the, this is the major, you know, index that most uh, stock market traders are following who follow technology okay. so things. I'm I'm getting this language from Wall Street. It's not my language, you know. So Although when you think about how they think you have bulls, bears, and fangs, <laughs> right? <laughs> and you begin to see the metaphorics at work here okay. in, 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 a ver in, a, in, in this how regressive this is, you. you know, in so many ways, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, and the screen culture is really coming out of, uh, I mean, out of me and a couple of other people that we're beginning to see the digitalization, you know, in this whole culture of the digital era and the dependence on external memory has produced a new kind of cave, a new kind of Plato's cave. You know, if you use that as our first modern movie theater, the cave itself, the, the, the Promethean urges, <laughs> you know, to steal the fire and to cast the light on the shadows, and now has to go through many series of reflectors, right? And mediation. In order to get it, and yeah, that's the Hegelian view. Yeah, that's right, yeah, 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 uh -huh. the mediations. Yeah, no, it's true, yeah. No, there are many levels, new levels of mediation that have to be passed through, right? And levels of abstraction, in a sense, right? In many, many, many ways. And yeah, so yeah, how do you move from the abstract back to the concrete through the, through the screen? Is that really a possibility anymore? Because, you know, you walk down the street, everybody's like this, right? right? You know, if I was a pickpocket, I'd be a multimillionaire. I mean, I'd just go around, you know, everybody's like this, they wouldn't, you know. Yeah. Yeah. We have representation of representations. Yes, we do. Like Baudrillard's simulacra. Yes, well, the simulacra is playing out, but it's even more dense than that now. I mean, it's much, much worse than the simulacra, I think. Where does yeah. virtual reality fit in? Is that analogous to my... Well, yeah, it's of course, yeah. yeah. That's yeah, what yeah, it is, right? part, part of the virtuality, yeah, the virtual. Yeah, virtual philosophy is something that came out of the Deleuze, uh, you know, Deleuze's uh, uh, thinking, you know, part of Deleuze's thinking, unlike the psychoanalytic went to the way of the virtual, you know, uh, world in a sense, you know, and this was a different, different approach, yeah. 
So, I mean, you know, alongside of this, though, screen culture is the financialization of everyday life, no longer the knowledge, uh, uh, knowledge economy, but really the financialization of everyday life. And we're going to see this in Lazzarato. Yeah? I mean, some of you know the graphs that in 1973, which to me marks a, a crucial moment in, in capital, you know, this is the line to 2019 and real wages, you know, what you actually can consume with, not your nominal wage, you know, your 100,000 is really maybe worth, you know, 50 in terms of real or whatever. I mean, you know, that's another story, you know, has, 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 has had a flat line throughout. So how is it that if this doesn't grow at all, people can save or buy a house? And what was created from 1973 onward is this new credit or creditor-debitor relationship that Nietzsche so aptly, you know, uh, presents in terms of who controls what, et cetera. So this, this whole set where CEO salaries went to this limit, the worker stays on this line. So how do you keep buying a house for boarding a car, you know, you go the way of the credit system. So really the making of the indebted person kind of, you know, soothes the anxiety, I can always borrow. I can always, you know, borrow on my credit card. I can borrow on this. I can get a home equity loan. All of these things, instead of looking at the real underlying anxiety of why is the system creating this, I mean, and how it's happening, as well as you know, mobilizing that anxiety to do something about it because it's so easily covered up. This is part of the, I think, what we're going to get with Chuvalas, and I'll, I'll point out some of those set sessions. But this is, you know, part of the, uh, the economy. So we have the financialization, the birth of the derivatives market, 1973, that is now, wow. you know, out of control. You know, as I said, the FANG economy, you know. Uh, two of the people in this room who probably would have been in literary studies in the 1980s, <laughs> but instead are in computer science because their jobs in the universities. You know, this is a, you know, I'm not going to say it's a symptom, but it's, it's kind of like part of the historical uh, framework, right? So anyway, uh, so we have th this going on. So Lazzarato will fit in this, right? Um, as well as uh, Eric Fromm, who is part of the neo-Freudian movement, but it's someone who is very interested in freedom as, as, as thought of as responsibility, something we've lost too. How are people afraid of freedom? How does this fear and this anxiety about freedom occur, in a sense? Why are people afraid to strike and break the law? What are they going to do to 20,000 PSC members? Or even if they're 3,000 that go out, what are they going to do? You know, ultimately, they're going to spend the night in jail. The jail can't fill you up, I mean, you know, in a way. Yeah? Yeah. They're going to have to release Richard X and Lincoln X and et cetera from jail. And, you know, and then tell Manafort he, he might have to go somewhere else. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so th th this is a real question, this question of freedom. You know, since because we don't really don't talk in this language anymore. Our freedom has become the freedom to shop. You know, I shop, therefore I am, or I am the shopper only. You know, or I am the commodity itself. To I am buy the machine. A CD. Yes, right, exactly. Consumers. Well, Barbara Barbara Kruger, the artist, had a whole movement. I shop, therefore I exist. You know, if you remember from the 80s and the 90s, she had this going out. So the modern cogito, I think therefore I am, is now I shop or I consume, therefore I am. And this becomes a way of covering up anxiety very much. Is this a product in Freudian terms, outside stage theory of oral regression? Is this another kind of moment of this oral regression that we've been going through for now close to you know, 40 something years, maybe 50 years. America's getting into training some of the slogans. And of course, I think also this whole emphasis upon cooking culture yeah. and restaurant culture, in a way. We, 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 we just keep feeding ourselves, looking for new ways to, you know, yeah, in so many, so many different ways. What, what does this really mean, you know? <laughs> politically, politically, since this is a class on the political, you know, implications of this new age of anxiety and what Chukalas wants to diagnose. Yeah. 
Yeah. Somebody so, by the name of Morris Thurman, back in the late 1990s, wrote an excellent book called The Twilight of American Culture. Yes. Are you aware of it? I, mean, I know more. It's Thurman. prescient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. prescient of all yeah, yeah. this. He, 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 he lives in Mexico. He left the United States. <laughs> yeah. But it's a good he, book. He's an expatriate. I mean, yeah, I know. He wrote a, a slew of books about this. About Right, secular, and, but uh, the problem with him is alternatives we should be like people in the old South and sit down and tell stories and I sit on the porches and all this. Yeah, oh. yeah. that's why <laughs> they, they were very civilized during the fugitives. Oh, the happy the fugitive, slaves. The fugitive, <laughs> yes, exactly. Which is a very good book, by the way. Happy Slaves and the Willing Slaves of Capital. Both of those books are good. So anyway, the question. I mean, I guess we're going to try to pose, and Peter can certainly add to this because this was, you know, we, we talked about the course and, you know, but I think he has a, you know, a, a, a more of a, a vision of where he wants to go. <laughs> uh, the, the question is really, in a sense, how do we got into this point where freedom is just another word, right? I mean, not, nothing left to lose, really, but also just another word to consume, to travel. You know, it's our mobility and it's our ability to consume and to get credit. We don't really think of it as a value anymore. What does it mean to have a free life? What does it mean to be really free from something? Free towards something, too. Where is that towards going? You know, so I think this is a very, very important uh, concept that we need. And what kind of anxiety does this raise in, in, the, in the human subject? You know, this age of anxiety, in a way. You know, and how has Big Pharma covered this up? this whole age of anxiety. We see all these lawsuits by the, uh, uh, by uh, what's her name, Letitia James now, on Purdue Pharma mm -hmm. and all these things. What's my back, Beth? Mm. <laughs> Just this, these, these lawsuits, are, Yeah. They're, they're just superficial um, posturing. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, but again, this whole cover-up of you know, where anxiety is, you know, what is the, the triumph of the non-therapeutic, the triumph of, you know, capital in terms of turning basically almost everything into machines, into, you know, willing slaves, as, as uh, Frederick Lord and Nassim, you know, into these willing slaves. You know, how does this new servitude come about? I think this is a very important uh, concept for, for Lazzarato, Right, Lazzarato, and also for Chukulas in a different way, in a more philosophical way, right, in, in some ways. Where is the servitude? And you see it almost in everything, right? You see it in almost everything. I mean, I, again, as being an aficionado of uh, jazz, I mean, I listen, again, I'm, I just got some new uh, Eric Dolphy, <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, you listen to these people like the Massey Hall, uh, thing of 1953. I mean, these cats got nothing but anxiety going on, but it's translated into this incredibly powerful music. And then you listen to the musicians today, they're basically anthologizers. I'm not saying that they're, they're bad, you know, that's not the point. Technically, they're superb, the virtuosity, but again, there's something lacking in terms of the anxiety or the tension that's being experienced between the outside and the inside. And how is that happening? You know, we see this in the black freedom movements. We see this in many, many things, you know? So we, 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 we can talk about this. I'm not saying that, you know, it's, it's completely dissipated, but it seems to have quelled in somewhat. And do we need, you know, what, what do we need going forward to make, you know, something happen once again, right? And in some ways, how is this anxiety to not only, you know, have, have we, gotten beyond the experience of anxiety at this point? You know, has that really happened and we've become so numbed? Collective nar narcotize. Okay, collective narcotization, <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, <laughs> collective nar nar narcosis, right, in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, it's not a, bad, not a bad phrase. I mean, it's, uh, you know, yeah, in some way. So, so this will be another, another uh, uh, you know, uh, element here to talk about. But I, I like these these phrases such as escape from freedom, right? The age we live in, you know, the age, it's not an epoch, it's an age. Anxiety, you know, we used to have, you know, as, as mo many of you probably know, also after this, this is the beginning of action painting, abstract expressionism, right? The Anxious Object being a very good book of the Marxist critic Harold Rosenberg. 
you know, and uh, a very, very good book on abstract expressionism and the relationship of anxiety to certain forms of painting and how that plays out on the canvas. So we, that, that's going on as well. And then the, rela the, the reactions to this in terms of American culture against the neo-Freudian movement, you have a kind of new left uh, which emerges, right, that it goes back to Marx, right, that goes back to, if you will, to the Marcusa of Aristotle civilization. 60s. Yeah, the early 60s and late 50s, and also the 50s in terms of a, a new culture of, you know, the Beats as poets, you know, other, you know, the novelists, you know, Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison, you know, and I'm just reading his jazz writings, magnificent, you know, the, the level that these people had. You know, very little right. Robin Kelly's a smart guy, and I like him very much. But, you know, I read Albert Murray on the jazz world. It's a different level. I mean, to me, it's just a different level. Maybe it's because I'm old. But, but anyway, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, the, the language is very substantive and, and, and down. So again, we're going to maybe kind of, kind of cr critique these moments, see how they are co-opted by the system, what the rebellion, if there's a, a space for rebellion, you know, et cetera. I mean, I'm noticing among the younger people in the classrooms, um, you know, between the ages of 18 to about 20, th there's no sense of rebellion in them, none. I mean, there's no guttural, uh, maybe you have it at DC, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. You have you don't have any rebellion in you. Entitlement. Entitlement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Everybody yeah. feels entitled. Yeah. They don't feel they have to be bound. Right. Yeah. Right. If they you go to college, you're entitled to a job. Huh? Yeah. Well, you're entitled you so to an A grade. <laughs> you pay so much for it now, right? So you well, feel yes, like of course. You shelled out all this money. You better give me something. <laughs> well, I mean, that's I the know. kind of the attitude right. you get a little bit, right? You're in debt too for so yeah. long. Yeah. It's a trade oh school. God. I want a it's job. Trade school, yeah. Right, yeah. right. This is very sad. And I mean, plus, I mean, we have sad students home. now who also, you know, are going to college, getting in debt, who actually may be homeless, who don't, mm -hmm. who have food shortage. I, mean, I think twelve percent homeless yeah. in the CUNY system was the statistic mm -hmm. this week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, twelve percent. Twelve percent of all CUNY students homeless. Wow. You're lucky in College Park. <laughs> <laughs> At least you have a university <laughs> housing, right? You can go to Silver Spring or Prince George's <laughs> County or whatever. Right, right. So anyway, yeah, no, it's a good collecting good, food on Rutgers yes, campus. Yes, exactly. For students, not for yeah, the community. Yes, exactly. Right? It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's amazing. Uh, uh, were you here when um, David Winters was saying there's a possibility of a strike yeah, of faculty yeah, I at just Rutgers? Got my thing to you know send in my okay. strike vote. Let's Good. Go. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ready. be out there. I'm ready. I'll I got come. my t-shirts ready. I'll come. I, know, I know how to get to Brunswick. To Brunswick. Yeah. I'm going to be in Newark. So You'll be in Newark. I'll come to Newark <laughs> instead. Okay, it's closer. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, or, you know, Jeremy Glick went there, by yeah, the way, yeah. so uh, get him and Michael McKeon and right. all these people. That's good. Okay. So anyway, I mean, yeah, uh, that's a real issue when you're facing supposedly an uh, economic rebound. And, you know, not to forget, when Chugalas is writing this piece in 2012, we're four years after the financial crisis. The stock market is up 400% on the indexes since Obama's since the uh, two months into Obama's presidency, 400 percent. The Dow Jones was 6,500 at its low point. Mm -hmm. It's over 25,000 today. Mm -hmm. And that's a measure, an indexical measure of the 30 largest corporations, mm -hmm. of which all the FANG economy are members. It also <laughs> helps that interest rates are cut unbelievably well, yes. low, artificially Not for you low. and me, Chris. <laughs> maybe, maybe for you. For I know you. Went to, I knew you weren't to leave it. But, you know, I mean, I'm not so sure. You know. But the Fed is keeping interest rates down yes, artificially. Of course. of course, of course. Yeah, print money. Yeah, it's an old tactic. Yeah, yeah. But it's working for the very rich. That's another thing too. Yeah. But 12, you have 12% homeless among CUNY. I mean, I was struck by that statistic. I mean, I know the homeless problem is an epidemic, but, but you know, you 12% you of the student population, that's a lot, that's a lot yeah. of students, yeah. right? No, and adjuncts are food insecure. Well, yes, yeah. that's, that's not only that, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anti-tenure mentality, no? Well, that's gone. Forget tenure. No, I know, that's what I'm saying. You tenure? It's gotten worse and worse. I'm not. 
<laughs> you are. You're in good shape. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Microsoft and tenure. Yeah. You can rewrite the uh, credit system. Yeah. <laughs> That's why you stay with them, huh? Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. I'm just. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, anyway, um, <laughs> you won't be back next week. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um, so uh, yeah. No. But I mean, to think about these contradictions, you know, and, and that are so visible, and you know, we're not even close to what's hidden. You know, that this is another thing, you know, in, in a sense. Right. You know, and uh, there's no measurement of the informal economies, you know, et cetera. So the age of anxiety may be putting it mildly, mm -hmm. you know, in, in a lot of ways. Term. Yeah, 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 we maybe do, yeah. Let me just say a thing about the word anxiety. You know, angst in Germany is anxiety, A-N-G-S-T, yeah, is the word for anxiety. Anxiety in the German sense of angst has no object. Mm -hmm. It's objectless. The object of anxiety is nothingness. Hence the Zen Buddhists, <laughs> as well as Sartre, being in nothingness. Heideggerian attempts being towards death in, mm -hmm. in terms of the nothingness. This encounter with nothingness is, uh, is absolutely crucial in order to get to the level of freedom, right? Fear, furt is probably what most people have, mm -hmm. right? Fear of something. Fear has an object. So one, anxiety is objectless, right? Whereas fear has an object. Please, please keep that in mind. It's very important since most of the theory comes out of Germany <laughs> on, this, on this notion. Or as uh, Hilda Doolittle said about Freud, sublimation, what dreary German drunk this up in, a, uh, in his study. <laughs> She was a patient. She wrote tribute to Freud in my HD. But uh, anyway. The poet. The poet, yes. Hilda Doolittle. Yeah, yeah, I know you know this thing. I mean, I want you to come sit up. I mean, especially <laughs> on the poetry and the literature. Only when you come in my territory. Okay, okay, poetry. okay. Fair okay. enough. Okay, fair enough. And um, so anyway. Um, um, so yeah, anyway, so this is a book that really what I would read. I mean, you know, then we'll begin with this today somewhat. I would read this as a symptomatology, right? This is a, sim a book of symptomatology. And, and first of all, it's about the lack of identity in, the, in, in, in our culture. The lack of really real identity, right? And individualism. And maybe, I, I, know, I don't know how many of you got the email, some of you got the email with this as being the reading and had a ch chance to read this. But this is the introduction, so maybe it's a good thing to go through this because we're doing this, you know, again, based on Chukalas' book. So the first chapter, and again, 2012, uh, the first chapter is called Identity Takes Its Place on the Political Stage, right? Pantarea, everything flows. This is from Heraclitus, the first uh, thing. Everything is in flux. He translates it as everything flows. All things are in flux is really the translation from Heraclitus. That is in nature, society, and in our minds, our thoughts, like li living organisms, are in a state of constant flux. They succumb to external pleasures, obey unknown laws, move relentlessly, accelerating and slowing down, advancing, retreating, attempting sudden leaps along a route that has neither direction nor end. The historical selection of ideas resembles the natural selection of species. The resilience of meanings in this march towards an unknown destination is unpredictable, and the dust of intellectual progress that is scattered by the relentless survival struggle will all, only retrospectively appear settled. Excuse me, uh, do yeah. you have any more copies? Or um, I don't have any more today, but I will have. But they Can have. Oh, she needs. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, Al, could you share with George? And, uh, I have an extra one because I have it on the computer oh. and the book. Okay. Oh. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. Good. Okay. So, um, what exists tends to be reproduced wholesale. And this is interesting too, apropos those of you that have read Walter Benjamin's The Work of Art in the Age of Industrial. Technical uh, Reproducibility, that basically capitalism has run out of ideas so much that it only can reproduce the yeah. past and recycle the past. Hence, you know, Planet of the Apes 15, you know, <laughs> you know et cetera, right? You know the story, right? <laughs> yeah, anyway, you know. So, what ex yeah. The inertia newcomers must overcome the inertia of social dynamics 
and the reflexes that existing semantic orders trigger. Worldviews aren't disposed voluntarily. In a state of vigilant wakefulness, established ideas tend to defend themselves against insidious intruders, whereas new ones, like spermatozoa, look for eggs to fertilize, of course, okay. But wakefulness itself isn't something new. Societies have always devised ways of handling the new gods. What has changed is the way novelty is perceived, and this is his first point. Intuitions are ever more frequently undermined, ideological convictions weakened, certainties readily abandoned, and entire value systems are deconstructed and reassembled anew overnight. This is what marks our age, this 2012, and I think before this, I think he's reflecting on really from the 90s forward. Misreading Arthur Rambeau, I think everybody knows who this uh, monster was, right? <laughs> we have the same birthday anyway. Uh, we must at all costs remain absolutely modern, right. right? We are absolutely modern. We must at all costs remain absolutely modern. Zealots of unrestrained modernization have fetishized newness. Conceptualist constructs seem finally rid of the compulsion to eternally repeat the same over and over. New ideas, regardless of their actual merit, are pe perceived ipso jure superior to the old ones. Even language can't tame the forces of change. Instead, it is subordinated to them. What's more, the terms that grant access to the valid is true have been accorded their own unique political correctness. I think this is very crucial that he's really talking about, in a sense, how the new is perceived. Right? If there is any such thing as a new, you know, and all the symptoms involved, right? So the talk of identity and difference must then take into account three facts. The discourse, merciless intrusion into an already disturbed setting. Two, the eagerness with which it is being imposed. And three, the effortlessness with which it seems to be displacing the established order. Difference suddenly and in stark contrast with the patterns that hitherto for designated the political field is no longer just a natural state but a crucial claim. The unprecedented clamor of demands for recognition, the talk of the individual's right to difference, issues surrounding multiculturalism all herald an ideological turn with unpredictable consequences. When difference in multiculturalism take the place of homogeneity and unitarity, the very coordinates of social organization are at stake. This means that these notions at the core of the individual's relation to the social collective would migrate to the center of socio-political inquiry. Bearers of institutionalized and incontestable personal rights, individuals will have to embrace the additional tax a task of determining their identity and carving out their own special otherness. Even if these developments do not immediately register as explicit regulatory adjustments, the shift in attitude is itself telling of a new era. Things are unfolding as if the now ex distant existential uncertainty of the untroubled modern socio-political thought is forced to give to way to externally dictated and standardized conformity about primordial alterity. The already unconvincing answers to the question, who am I, or for the first time in recent history, and this is again very important, elevated to objects of systemic control. Identity is politicized. Mm -hmm. okay? So I think this is very good in terms of an opening, what he sees new in this new age of anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. The, the question of identity has become politicized, and the who am I never really answered, correct? You know, uh, the, the Kantian question, who am I, what am I to do, you know, or the existential questions of who am I, you know, am I alone and what am I to do, have not really been answered, but now they're elevated to the, the, the systemic control by the system. Going back to Wiener and others in terms of the construction of, you know, the social sciences in post-World War II, what we're seeing now is a systemic control of identity vis-a-vis -vis difference, 
right? We were beginning to see this, and I think this is where he's trying to go here. So this book, he's going to announce his, uh, his, um, his intentions, looks at the historical conditions of this ideological remodeling. Very important, ideological remodeling. It focuses on the current political discourse that revolves around identity and difference, a discourse that seems entirely symptomatic of our times. Regardless of complex ethical parameters underlying this ostensibly pathological obsession with individuality and freedom of choice, with collective identity recognition with difference and with difference, is a widespread confusion caused by radical shifts in the historical function of social collectives and the state. It doesn't seem at all surprising that the sudden outburst of discussion about identities is gaining ground at a time when, one, the ideological cohesion and conceptual wholeness of liberal societies is in decline, and why, when, two, conventional understandings of the relation between individual and society, national and supranational, political and cultural, and generally between the individual and its social surroundings are undergoing sweeping reforms. Seen in this light, the right to difference seems inextricably tied to a semantic redefinition of the conditions of differentiation within the social setting. If representatives of the person's place in the world and the terms used for understanding society as a solid and incontestable cultural unity are being reconsidered, the same will happen in, to the terms concealing, I mean, excuse me, concerning human self-knowledge. And if Gadamer, and if you don't know, Gadamer is Hans Jörg Gadamer, a German philosopher, student of Heidegger. Uh, his most famous book is Truth and Method, uh, Truth as Method, which was a, a, a very deep hermeneutical <laughs> attempt to look at the, 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 the movement for, for truth, as well as a book called Philosophical Hermeneutics. And he wrote a book on the Greek notion of therapy as well what the ancient Greeks thought of as the therapeutic, how does one heal in, in the ancient Greek sense. Okay, so he wrote that more than anything, understanding constitutes being and produces history. So for Gadamer, being cannot exist without this verstandung, this understanding of history where we are. You know, very, very important for him. Yeah, and, and the method that we might indeed be at a turning point although it remains impossible to deduce any intention as such by an historical happening that stubbornly refuses to end, we have every reason to believe, hope even, that the period we're going through is transitional. It's, it's true. Are we are going through, is this, this age of a new age of anxiety transitional towards something, or is it the end of something? <laughs> extinction. Right? Is it extinction? Climate change being one example, obviously, you know, it's, if you if you take that on as a, you know, as one major issue, um, etc. Okay, one thing though is certain, as far as the term we use for understanding ourselves and society are concerned, the break with the recent pact is by all means radical. Around the world, delineated and conceptually airtight socio-cultural schemes have been replaced, and this is interesting, by increasingly open, precarious, unruly even, social formations. The cohesion, stability, and self-sufficiency of grand narratives have been irrevocably compromised. It's political, con and as you know, grand narratives was the phrase used by uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard mm -hmm. to advent the postmodern condition of where he says, you know, the grand narrative of emancipation, the Enlightenment discourse, is over. Yeah. There's no such thing as emancipation, right, in a way, these, these grand narratives of emancipation. The proletariat as the subject, agent of, uh, as extermination, angel of capital, finished. Another grand narrative finished, etc. So he's obviously referring to this in terms of the grand narratives of history. Yeah. Um, um, so, in, 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 in its political context aside, Thatcher's emblematic catchphrase, there's no such thing as society, right. there are individual men and women, 
you know, and as you know, she's famous for the Tina syndrome, mm -hmm. of which some of these people grew up under in, in this room. I can, you know, not me, but anyway, <laughs> Tina, the Tina syndrome, there is no alternative, right? A syndrome that seems to be, you know, pervasive and getting more and more pervasive because as Aronowitz was pointing out earlier today with Brexit, the Labor Party, even one of its best uh, people, can't think of an alternative can't think of a solution, mm -hmm. right, in a way. Mm -hmm. So there really is no alternative at this point for a lot of groups, right, because we have not been able to think. We're, we're always thinking, if you will, in this reduplication. We're always reduplicating the past, mm -hmm. you know. In the image of the bourgeoisie, as Marx puts it in the Manifesto of the Communist Party, which is a wonderful starting point for how does the bourgeoisie shape the world, or the ruling class shape the world in its own image, and to paraphrase uh, Leonard Cohen, the rich have their channels in the bedrooms of the poor, right? right? In many ways, right? Very interesting in this way, right? Okay. It seems to capture the essence of an age when singular, imaginary, invested, and objectively definable collectives that sustained individuals have been replaced by a vitigating, vitiation, vitiating, excuse me, cluster of alternatives. Traditional forms of nostalgia and the societies that induce them will never be the same. Solid and shared symbolic structures have found themselves knee-deep in bondless individualism, saturated with vague, vague anti-status sentiment and corroded by the overabundance of irreconcilable symbols, signals, and choices and can thus no longer functional. function as the palpable reproductive hubs of meaning that they once were. So again, this loss of meaning, this loss of historical meaning, you know, et cetera. You know, when you talk to someone about the term alienation, they don't really know what the hell you're talking right. about, right? I mean, in, 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 in a certain way. It's really, it's, it's problematic, yeah, yeah, right, in many ways. I mean, you know, and the especially then, what are you alienated from? Much less the etymology means we are without lean, right, and the, the, the legal definition of it, but what are you alienation from? You know, the climate change, nobody talks about the alienation from nature mm -hmm. in yeah. terms of the right. human subject, mm -hmm. or the alienation from the spirit, the alienation of, uh, from work, the alienation from each other, the self-alienation that goes mm -hmm. with this. None of this is really problematized anymore mm -hmm. at all. We just have an opiate crisis. Right. Right. right? We just have a, you know, a culture of depression and suicide. Mm -hmm. See, I would rewrite the age of anxiety, the age of depression. <laughs> Right? Mm -hmm. This is what I would. I, this is why I would rewrite this call. I mean, you know, in a sense, if you were interested in, you know, we have a fiction writer here. So anyway, you know, the age of depression really, I think, captures even more so. Mm -hmm. And do people even know they are depressed? That's another thing. <laughs> you know, and remember, their dollar signs: repression, SS. There's <laughs> depression, SS, and same in suppression, and all of these terms, right, in some ways. Barred signifiers in terms of the Lacanian foreclosure that we're also maybe, maybe going through, too. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, I, I'm not, I know I'm riffing on this a little bit, but I think it's important. Okay? This, so, this section, yeah, please. sorry, this yeah, section I'm listening, yeah. really reminded me of the manifesto. Mm -hmm. I mean, all that is solid melts into air. All you mean that is a Marx's holy is, manifesto? Yeah, okay. all that is holy is profaned. I yeah. mean, this section just seemed really to to resonate with okay. with that section of the manifesto. Have all of you read the uh, manifesto of the Communist Party, oh, yeah. or at least have a familiarity times, with it? Times. Yeah, I know you have. <laughs> Al, 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 you, you, you party carrying, card, card carrying man. Yeah, you better have uh, read it. Yeah, yeah, they would have. <laughs> yeah, any, any, uh, have you had any exposure to? I mean, it's a beautiful piece of uh, of literature. Uh, to say the least. I mean, yeah, yeah. I read it maybe like four years ago. Okay. So. You remember it at all? Not that much. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. She's quoting from it all the solid melts into air, right? What heavenly ecstasy. Yeah, anyway. 
you know, the Dutch the halo. Struic, the Manifestos are my favorite form of literature. Actually. It's a wonderful <laughs> film. Yeah, That's the point. it's a wonderful <laughs> film. Yeah, 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 yeah. I do. I love them. They, yeah, yeah. they cheer a, me up. We, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you come out feeling bad. I'm gonna I'm give you a copy of the manifesto <laughs> for a left turn. Thank I'm gonna bring it next week. I'm gonna give you the original edition. Oh. The original. Yeah, I, I got some in my the closet. Unsigned, unsigned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you guys, you, you have some exposure to this a little bit. Ten years ago. Ten years ago. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. DC 30, they're not making you read it at DC. You tell your boss, bring, bring him a copy, you know. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be at it. You probably read it. Yeah, okay. Um. All right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Good. All right. Well, anyway, as, as Beth was saying, there's a lot of remindedness here and, and uh, you know, the quote uh, that Chris came up with and all that is solid melts into air, uh, which is the name of a book, by the way, by Marshall Berman. Hmm. Uh, you know, he used to live on the Upper West Side and died at a Greek diner. Uh, and anyway. Real New York. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Perry died at the, the Greek, Greek diner. diner. Yes, yes. Yeah. Back to the Greek diners. Yes, that's right. That's the return of the repressed. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So what what do you see here in terms of the manifesto, though, Beth? I mean, tell me how you're looking at it. Because, because I this, mean, this yeah. section reminds me of that section uh -huh. where, where he's saying that all traditional forms have been destroyed. Yeah. And broken down. And not replaced. And, and, and replaced with nothing except reliance upon the individual. I mean, and that's what this section of the manifesto right. he's talking about. So, I mean, but I guess part of what... Oh, because when I read that, it was so evocative of that part of the manifesto, yeah. I thought to myself, well, right. so what is new about this? Yeah, interesting. Mm. That's good when you say that, because to me, part of the thrust of this chapter is that the novelty itself is not new at all. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. There's no newness really out there, right, yeah. in some ways. I mean, you know, to, yeah. And, and he's also talking about this, you know, the, this kind of endless recyclability, right, in terms of the name of the new, you know, et cetera, right? I mean, we have the Democratic Socialists right now, though we, we can harp on them a little bit, but, but anyway, the, you know, they don't really know the history of democratic socialism, right? They don't really know where this came from, how it started with Frederick Engels who wanted to make some kind of compromise with parliamentary socialism and how that developed for the past hundred and you know, fifty years and what all the gyrations it went through, et cetera. You know, and nobody's talking on democratic socialism about, you know, uh, taking owner nationalization of the uh, of the energy right. sector or of the utilities. But this was a demand, right. and you know, some of you know very well the the uh, the uh, utility companies were run by the cities. You know, they were they were actually in the hands of the government. And if you didn't spend your energy allotment, you would get a check. Can you imagine Con Ed sending you a check? <laughs> you didn't use enough electricity this month, <laughs> right? Yeah, but this was going on over a hundred years ago. This is how much we we have a regression in terms right. of at least quote unquote social progress, right? Which is another you know another story. Okay, good. Okay, so I like the way these ideological bind, bonding agents which guaranteed cultural homogeneity at the uh, bottom of page 11, and regulatory independence in societies have become incapacitated, debilitated, and worse, privatized. And this is the important part here, the privatization of, you know, agents which used to, go, go, you know, Bond, you know, at least guarantee some cultural homogeneity. Excuse me. We're drifting within a constellation of universal haziness, increased vagueness, and semantic disorder. It has become harder to gauge the objective historical potency of reality while remaining capable of deciphering the meanings and the limits of information. Even if we want to change the world, we have no idea, and this is crucial right, too, right, right. how or where to start, what tools to use, or even what it is we want to change. Mm -hmm. And I think these are four very good talk. You know, this is like kind. Who am I? What am I to do? You know, who, you know, what is man? And, you know, is there a God? Something like that. It's reduced. <laughs> we, we want to change the world. However, we have no idea of the how, the where, <laughs> the what, or what it is we want, what the desire is. Chaotic right? yeah. disarray is yeah, very good. Good yeah. term. Chaotic, Chaotic disarray. <laughs> good. All right, good. 
Yeah, to make matters worse, you thought it was bad up to now, this lack of focus has distorted the psychological parameters of socialization. And again, I, I think one of the most important parts of Gramsci's work, I mean, to go back to our friend uh, from last semester and who was, uh, you know, criticized a bit earlier today, and rightfully so, in, in the context he was criticized. But anyway, Gramsci talked about the socialization of ideas. Mm -hmm. And this is a, certainly a way of reading history that is very much forgotten in the academic institutions. How does an idea become to take currency? How does it become socialized in the schools and in the cultures? Right? How does this really occur over these kind of periods? So Chukalas is really looking at the psychological parameters of socialization and is weakened, and this is very important, I think, because he's really talking about community being completely at loose ends, weaken the reassuring sense of belonging to a finite, stable, and coherent social whole. Nobody has a sense of belonging, right. therefore completely anxious without knowing it. Fewer people than ever seek to satisfy their practical or existential needs as members of some collective entity. We feel no, you know, collective enti entity. We feel no group, really, in terms of our praxis. Fewer still find comfort in the embrace of a multitude that allows them to express their impulses and manage, even possibly control, their inborn panics. Right? There's no such thing as the therapeutic community. There's no such thing as intervention on this level. You know, what are you going to do, call a hotline? Right? You know, really think about this. Although people are still free not to overestimate the effectiveness of their personal desires and acts, and while remaining cautious of the freedoms available to them, even so they are expected to toil in solitude, to gain their own values and their own meanings, to understand the world and name its contents using their own terms, to choose their own course of action and to solve their own problems privately. Again, this privatization of the self, privatization in the economy, privatization of ideas in the schools, et cetera, et cetera. The range of personal choices expanding, offering abundant and often contradictory messages outside common networks of meanings and symbols. This type of freedom owes its appeal to the fact that like the object of faith, it can be neither proven nor refuted, which explains why it's being offered as both a universal cure and a placebo. Have faith, you know. But, like most conventional wisdoms, it too has proven to be spectacularly false. The expansion of liberties hasn't delivered the dawn of a new age of reason that we were promised. Again, the failure of the Enlightenment, a failed project, which Leotard, by the way, is picking up in terms of the grand narrative as early as 79 mm -hmm. as a symptom. You know, this is, a, uh, you know, he's writing this, you know, close to, you know, nearly a half a century later. That's how, how much time has passed since the coinage of the, the term postmodernism, you know, became household. Uh, Leotard wrote the report on knowledge 1979. So that's literally 40 years, almost, you know, almost 40 years ago now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and by the way, for the people, I don't know, do you know this book, The Postmodern Condition? Okay, there's a whole thing about it. It's the transformation to the computerized societies. It's a kind of threshold text in terms of cultural cultural thinking, you know, on, uh, on uh, you know, the information age, if you will, uh, becoming dominant. Yeah, yeah. And it goes through that, uh, that the information age knows no use value anymore, only exchange value. It's very interesting. He's very interested about this in, in a lot of ways, which kind of explains part of the Fang economy, how it came to be, and this amazing tendencies towards a new startup every day or apps. All you have to do is take the New York subway, and you find out about the new, uh, you know, all the new startups and the new apps. You're, you know, you're, <laughs> yeah. What's next? You know, unseemly. Unseamless, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Anyway, <laughs> you know, anyway, threadless. Yeah, anyway. But like conventional wisdom, it too has been, yeah, et cetera. Our current convictions are neither more rational nor less irrational than the ones they deposed. On the contrary, 
disenchantment never seemed a more distant feat. Now, what I'd like to do, that's the, that's the introduction, and he kind of lays it out in the next one, The Future ap Appears. The book is divided into five parts. But why don't we do this for, for a second? Go to the footnotes, which are at the back. Uh, um, each chapter, each chapter has footnotes beginning on 107, right? And he, he, he cites some books. But anyway, number two is interesting. The debate over the production of free individual cultural self-determination and the right to difference in multiculturalism all fall under the same historical rubric. The augment, augmentation of personal liberty, the institutional affirmation of a freely constituted cultural groups, and the new model of organizing societies all say, share the same conceptual starting point. Right? Right? Okay? The protection of free individual cultural self-determination. Uh, then he cites mostly books here, but this this is important too. And you know, one good thing, uh, you know, we're reading Freud and philosophy in the other class. Uh, footnote number ten is what um, um, the type of freedom owes its appeal to the fact, like the, the object of faith, that can never be proven nor refuted, right? Um, is, is from Ricoeur's uh, Freud and Philosophy, the essay on interpretation. So anyway, um, the disenchantment of the world, um, you know, as you know, uh, this, is, this comes out of Weber, and uh, uh, this is something we've gone through, Adorno and Horkheimer, the Frankfurt School uh, engaged us the fact. Stiegler, one of his better books, I think, and a very readable book, The Reenchantment of the World, is a kind of anecdote to this. It's very interesting that he really, in some ways, wants to go back <coughs> to a past. It's not nostalgic, but at least to look at symbols in a different light instead of under this reduplication, etc. I mean, for lack of a better term, it's a kind of return to a kind of magic, you know, in a certain, certain way. What have we lost in this age of cynicism, age of anxiety, et cetera, is that kind of magical wonderment, right? He, he's actually talking about this whole category of, uh, of uh, re-enchantment. And you can read alongside this Bruno Bettelheim's great book, The Uses of Enchantment, which is very good for, you know, looking at childhood. And The Use of Fairy Tales on the left by uh, Jack Zipes. Yes. Well, his best book is Don't Bet on the Prince. Yes. But anyway, it's a very <laughs> good book, very, very solid. Anyway, so I think you get the, the, the drift here, right, in, in some ways what he's really going to start doing uh, in this age of anxiety. But let's look, at, let's look at the outline of the book. We can go on to that. We have time today. And uh, I was going to also point out an essay that he wrote for us that's online, too. What's that? No, it's not table of contents. It's uh, number two, the future appears. This is old school, Al. Yeah, old school. You just lay out the book in, in the form of the essay. The book is divided into five parts. It begins with the claim that any understanding of identities and difference can only be social historical, socio historical. You know, you just don't get a, uh, you know, an identity, right? It's not a grand thing. It's all socio historical. The meaning and function of words is intrinsically bound to the particular conceptual schemes within which the words emerge. In this sense, the unfolding of social representations of identity must be placed within a wide range, wider range of ideas that originated in 18th century European political thought. I mean thought, right? Whether, and this is a good question, legitimate children or bastards of the Enlightenment, and I think the children of the Enlightenment, obviously the Enlightenment's you know, fathers were Rousseau, Diderot, Voltaire, of course, in Germany, Kant, mm -hmm. right? David Hume and Adam Smith in Scotland, right? These are the, the, the moments of the There's Enlightenment. There's a book called Voltaire's Bastards. I, right. I don't know if you're familiar. I, am I haven't familiar read it, but yes. <laughs> yes. it was written by title. Canadians. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, yeah, well, he was the meanest of all of them. You know, he was not uh, not a nice person. I, I think I know what he anyway. <laughs> Yeah, anyway. Okay, so anyway, or the Bastards of the Enlightenment, or there are three, the masters of suspicion, or the bastards, are, of course, Marx, mm -hmm. <laughs> right, Freud, <laughs> and Nietzsche. Right. You know, these are your three, basically, bastards of the Enlightenment, of which the Frankfurt School owes a lot of what, no, no such thing as the idea of progress, 
mm -hmm. right? Let's think about it that way. The dialectic of enlightenment, there's both enlightenment and counter enlightenment, and the thing is to be see, able to see this as dialectically, not just as singular progress, right? You know, et cetera, et cetera. a very, very beautiful passage. And the whole notion of the individual, if you're interested in this and expanding the horizon or research, read Odysseus or the myth of enlightenment mm -hmm. in the dialectic of the enlightenment uh, by uh, Adorno and Horkheimer. As Odysseus as being, you know, the self-sufficient one on his way home, how this becomes a myth of enlightenment, this notion of autonomy this notion of uh, self-sufficiency, etc. Kant's definition of enlightenment is, is the emergence, a man's emergence or a human being's emergence from their self-incured immaturity. And immaturity is defined as not being able to move without the guidance from another. And that immaturity and that guidance of another is because of laziness and cowardice. Right? So he goes through this very elaborately in terms of a piece called What is Enlightenment? And this was 1784, five years before the uh, French Revolution. So anyway, okay, openly or not, we agree that all statements, including those that vainly try to elucidate the issue of who are we in this age of anxiety, must be articulated and substantiated rationally, and that they must comply with the fundamental, universal, and inalienable value of liberty. But before we can pose a question, we must think and speak as rational and free agents. Right. So Nietzsche once said, and this is important to remember, history should be interviewed by a madman like me. Nietzsche's going against this grain. You know, you really need the mad to question history. It's very interesting, you know, in a way that Nietzsche's notion of history goes against the strain of the rational, right, agent. The free agent, yes, but the rational is another story. And Dean right. Rowe said, in a mad world, act like a madman. Yes, that's true. Well, that's, that's, that's maybe a good slogan for the new, new, new left, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> right? <laughs> in some ways, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? This in itself was a historical break with the past. And he's talking about the Enlightenment. We're really in 1750 to 1800 at the beginning of this book in terms of the value formation, right? Ideas about the organization and politics of society, the meaning of selfhood and otherness, about being human, individual collective identities was henceforth uncoupled gradually and when necessary forcibly from traditional irrational and illiberal or pre-liberal religious and ethnic origins. This made central, again, the primordial question of singling the first person plural, the royal we, the Hegelian we, if you will, the universal. Right? We, the future societies made up of free individuals would not be able to reply, at least not exclusively, on divine orders, straightforward and obvious cohabitation rules, or the whimsical expectations of the perennial oppressive ruling classes, any more so on the Aristotelian desire to live together. What we refer to as public and its relation to the parts that inhabit and constitute it would have to be justified and rationalized based on coherent and consistent principles. As a result, these distinctly modern procedures responsible for generating and solidifying a non-intuitive ontological meaning for societies, and for that matter, all collective entities were born. Free and rational in individuals were expected to join together and socialize as if convinced of the, both the necessity and the rationality of the whole, even if they didn't believe in it. The ratio ascendi Ascendi of all society of societies, groups, unnatural and forced as it is, became the object of a wider theoretical inquiry in the issue of establishing and rationalizing organized authority as a lawful and rational community of free people was suddenly 
inescapable. And here we go. In this sense, the predominance of Rousseau's rational and cohesive contractual society, I suggest everybody, if you're interested in what's going, the discourse on the origin of inequality, which is 1753, Rousseau, yeah, and the social contract, especially the first two chapters on the origin of the social contract. All uh, right, very important. Why? What, what are you smiling about? You want to mention Diderot? Yeah, yeah. No, no. I yeah, just, yeah. I had enough Rousseau, but so. You had enough Rousseau. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Well, anyway, I mean, it's interesting in the sense because what we're going to be getting. Look, the reason to do this, and the reason I'm mentioning this, is that in the popular circulation of ideas, we're going to hear more and more about rights. We're going to hear more about emancipation. We're going to hear more about this. These have theoretical underpinnings that go back to this period that he's really uh, uh, talking about. I mean, Diderot is very important. Diderot is not written well, in this. I wouldn't in this. dare substitute Diderot for Rousseau, but yeah. it's looking at the absurdities of what Rousseau wrote as Hannah Arendt. So. Well, I think rightfully understands okay, that is what enough. we should be talking about. Okay, okay, well we can bring that up later in the, that's about, yeah, yeah, because, because uh, Hannah Arendt thought that the French Revolution was inferior to the American Revolution. This was a working premise of Hannah Arendt. And this is one of the reasons that Rousseau is not in her canon. Mm -hmm. And she shares this with, again, Leo Strauss. Mm -hmm. That's you know, right. I jumped into that camp. Yeah, 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 yeah. Our revolution yeah. was a war of independence. We exchanged the ruling class of the old country. I wouldn't call it a ruling class. For a new ruling class, yeah, right, the, right, the right, ruling right. class of money, right? Yeah, little one. The yeah. aristocracy yeah. was yeah. replaced by the money. It, but, but the distinction she's making is it was a revolution of peers, as and without the notion of equality for the masses that came in in the French Revolution. So it had a very different effect. And also the very fact that uh, these revolutions just have not, you know, You know one like of the most profound so. things that Karl Marx said? This wow. has always struck me. He was asked whether or not someone's more intelligent than another, they have more intellectual superiority. And his response to the question was, we will not know the answer to that question until we have full equality. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, you have to think of this socially, historically, do we, when we get to full equality, then maybe we can start measuring these things. And that was a value of the French Revolution that has really just gone totally by the wayside. Mm -hmm. And we see this functioning in the universities today. Yeah. I mean, you know, look, you can be at USC and be a director of admissions and get 20000 under the table, you know, for, uh, you know, I'm going to let this one in. You're a, an actress on a, you know, TV mm -hmm. show and your daughter's a goof off. You can photo shoppers, well, I don't know what it was, soccer player, lacrosse player, Dr. and get her Dre in. Right, right, exactly. All, all of these things. Off. And we're only at the tip uh, of the social iceberg. Media social media. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. I didn't know that. That's a, that's a special category. Yeah. Yeah. She yeah. makes ten yeah. times what you do. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> that, that puts it yeah, no, I'm, I'm well aware of what, <laughs> where the, where the currency is. These days. Yeah. I miss my calling on all these ideas. <laughs> yeah. So uh, anyway, going back to Iran, we can we can go back to her later and talk about this difference in thinking about you know the Constitution of the United States. I mean, I, I read. I mean, to me at least. I mean, I, just to put this out there, and, and I know you're reading her, and she's an extremely serious thinker, and you know, one of the you know uh, leading lights. I, I think particularly are thinking about bureaucracy. If you read the Jasper's um, uh, Arendt correspondence of the 50s during this period, it's amazing in terms of the odd age of anxiety. Um, but, on the other hand, when it came to questions of equality and violence, you know, and mass education, she was pretty much off, you know, in many ways. You know, you can begin to see this. Her debate with Fanon is very sterile. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, very sterile. And on revolution and on violence, etc. But we, we, we go back to her. I'm not, I'm not mm -hmm. trying to, Thank you know, you. I mean, I, I, I you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was unfortunate. I was not at the new school when she was teaching, but I, I heard it was very funny uh, the way she would come in with the Pall Mall cigarette and oh, yeah. smoke about four or five and lecture on Gant for my own brand you know. too. I didn't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, all right. So, you know. okay. So Herder's rigidly historically evokes Geist, Hegel's understanding of the state of the embodiment of the 
the, uh, of the transcendental spirit are all parts of the same historical and logical framework. Societies being by definition contractual, national, and rational must be perceived as both concrete and uniform closed political and cultural orders that can be legitimized as necessary and holistically constituted conceptual constructs. Under these conditions, notions surrounding the relationship of the individual with society would be placed at the center of a new discourse that would fulfill the emerging functions, address the priorities of, and satisfy the natural, national prerequisites, notional prerequisites, excuse me, for the establishment of contemporary powers. As a result, the contractual formations, enduring national cultures and exclusive collective identities would be established within a common historical process. It looked like this circus, as if the circle could close, maybe even be squared. But unsurprisingly, history had other plans. The prevalence of state nationalism established new threats. So he's going through the history here. I don't know, I really have to read all this. This is basically how the real is the rational and the rational is the real. And this is a saying of Hegel, right, in terms of the real is the rational, the rational of the real was taken up by the totalitarian states. Mm -hmm. The state is the actual embodiment of the rational, right? And so the Third Reich was the embodiment to some people who were on the right wing of the Hegelian trajectory, thought that this was the embodiment of the rational idea of the nation state and modernity. I mean, of course, there's a lot of criticism about this, but then the question is, yes, what does the real as the rational really you know, mean in, the, in this context? And how did this rational get so displaced, right? from what we thought was an emancipatory discourse around three values, freedom, equality, and brotherhood, or community, if you want to, yeah, yeah. Or Geist, you know, in a sense, the phenomenology of community. You know, that's where Geist has been retranslated as by uh, Fred Jameson. Yeah. Slogans. What's that? Slogans. Well, they were slogans, but they had meaning to a lot of people. Yes, I mean, they you know, still do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean there were slogans in terms of a battle cry, but there's no there's no upsurge without you know the ideological uh, bantering, right? Right? Yeah, I mean Lenin didn't tell the peasants I'm going to give you back because the land the first year, then I'm going to take it back because the state needs it, and the second year you don't mobilize people this way. You know, it's a it's a different you know the historical uh, circumstances changed in some ways. So yeah, but I mean I think there were more than slogans because. In, in a way, you know, I mean, the French Revolution, if you look at the comparable moments in, in France up until today, and I'm not saying this is, you know, the end all to be all with macaroni or whatever his name is. <laughs> <laughs> macaroon, right? Uh, that, uh, it's more French, macaroon, in, in power. But, you know, you look at France during, you know, the 1871 Commune, right? <laughs> you know, Leon Bloom during the 1920s, you know, before Vichy. Yes, they jumped into bed with the Germans quicker than any other culture <laughs> to the, you know, to the well, west of Germany. But, but on the other hand, and then May of 68, I mean, there has been that tradition there of that kind of struggle, right, in terms of ideas that were related to the Enlightenment and to emancipatory politics. Yeah. De Gaulle had to flee to England. That's how serious the threat Yeah, was. but the and Communist they, Party they, didn't support the students and they didn't, uh, no, they got, I mean, they came was, back. It, yeah. we, ne we never had a comparable uprising. No, no, of course not. No, no, no. The 60, the, the rebellions here, in, in a sense, it yeah, was, very was, disconnected and discombobulated compared right. to May of 68. Mm -hmm. You closed down the government. Right. Think about this, you get a group of uh, students, right? right, right. <laughs> take the bar take take on the streets, right? The workers join in. Right. The state is shut down for an entire month. You know, of course, the the old old the white guys in the uh, in the uh, communist party. Oh, you know, we're going to have to compromise. We may lose some jobs, right? Etc. Yeah, they they, they, they struck on the deal. Talking yeah. about slogans, yes. graffiti, nothing all but, over. nothing but, yeah. So, I mean, this, this to me is a result of a cultural moment, right, that is very deeply embedded in some of the values of that Declaration of the Rights of Man. Yeah? The Declaration of the Rights of Man. So, I mean, you know, in, in some ways. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, I know. I know our rent was received very well in the United States <laughs> for a little while. Yeah. Not around Eichmann in Jerusalem. But she was. <laughs> yeah, but she was received very, very favorably in the United With that? States. No, not that. Okay. That but got her in trouble. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that got her in trouble. Yeah, big time trouble. Yeah. That was before APAC. <laughs> right. Got her in big trouble. Yeah. No, and, and actually, I'm surprised by her. Uh, I, I'm not surprised because I just didn't know the history and I'm just learning it, but she was Hungarian, right? Or no? No, she was ooh, German ooh. Jewish, upper, upper, ooh, she was ooh, wealthy. Rosa. Arendt? Yeah, Arendt. Arendt. No, she wasn't yeah, no. Hungarian. Hel Hel she Agnes was Heller was, uh, was uh -huh. a Hungarian Jewish, okay. but, but Arendt was German Jewish. German, they, they were all very wealthy. Well, she writes right? <laughs> They were a wealthy family. Arendt was wealthy. Walter Benjamin came from some, some money. Adorno was very privileged uh, in a way. Horkheimer's father was an industrialist. You know, all these people came from, you know, at least upper upper bourgeoisie. Even you know. Angles, yeah. But when she writes about Hungary, it's, it's, it's she, she, she's The Hungarian in 1956. Yeah. Yeah. When she's writing about that, she's so yeah. obviously anti Marxist. I mean, that comes through in, in her writings, at least to me. So, I mean, yeah, or, but, or, or but again, that was not a Marxist uh, uh, police action. That was a that was a you know a, a Khrushchevian Soviet Marxist mm -hmm. moment, right? I mean, to be be careful about it. I mean, you know, in a way, because she was married to a com. You know, she, her her hu second husband was a Communist Party member. Was a communist. Okay. And there is con there is talk about that she was she was um, you know in, in constant dialogue with him and a lot of the writing at times came came from him. Okay. You know? No, I'm, so, I'm here to learn, yeah. not to talk. No, no, I'm, I'm just saying. It's, I mean, it's, I, I, it's her her her, <coughs> her belief still in freedom comes through in in her in yes. her writing. Yes. But Marx Which did not like uh, deny freedom. He just said we we would not talk about freedom because we have not passed through the realm mm -hmm. of necessity. You know, I mean, through this is a crucial moment. You know, until we pass through the realm of necessity, what I put on the board today of Lacanian need in a certain way, I mean, Lacan's not stupid. I mean, you know, he's thinking through this vis-a-vis -vis Marx in some ways and Freud. Let yeah, me be yeah, quiet yeah. on this, though. No, no, it's seeing, okay. that, seeing the capitalist world as the free world as compared to the, to the right. second and third yeah. worlds. No. So that's where I'm saying that would be where, no. where she... I think falls down in imagining that there's freedom in a capitalist society. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I don't, I don't know. You know, uh, again, the freedom for Arendt. Uh, I mean, I know this is not. I mean, she's important, and I mean, I know Chukolas has read her, and she's a very important political theorist. But freedom for for Arendt is going back to the Greek, uh, the Greek yeah. polis. Okay, mm -hmm. it's a it's a very nostalgic. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's almost a kind of fleshing out of what Heidegger wanted mm -hmm. to do without Heideggerian pre-Socratic moments, right? Mm -hmm. She wanted to actually situate us back in something that she's not going to call slave society, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? In, in, in some ways, she's mm -hmm. going to call this as a, a special moment that we should be mimicking, and this is where freedom would be. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying this is all wrong headed. Well, I would I mean, think this would be discussion. the freedom that, yeah. that I'm getting from her is just for me to go to a little police like this and be able to discuss with you without being too embarrassed except for the uh, the machines, you know. The, oh, okay, yeah. Uh, but the, that's why, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but it's, it's the This day and age, this, this is, is the child's play. Uh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> embarrassed, <laughs> uh, you know, come on. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, right, it's, it's right. the freedom to speak in, 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 in that... Uh, yeah, but I mean the freedom of assembly, but I mean who's the freedom of assembly really in terms of revolutions when you think about that? It was the freedom of the new printing presses. Think about this. France had mm -hmm. one printing press or two printing presses, you know, which were controlled by their dominant aristocratic hyphen uh, divine class. After the revolution, there were 500 printing presses. Yes. Everybody was expressing, you know, and, and Desmoulins, saint Just, all of these people, they, they were out there. You look at the proliferation. Robert Darnton, who, um, you know, it's worth reading uh, because he's, he studies this literature during this period, shows this at work. I mean, how much it freed the, the tongues and the pens of so many French people who before mm -hmm. had been totally suppressed. We don't have that kind of outpouring here. You know what we had in the United States? You know what the literacy campaigns were about in the United States? So people could operate machines. So you would teach people how to read so they could work a conveyor belt. Put this button here, push here, push here. I, I bet you most of the verbs they learned were about doing factory work, right? In some ways. This was the literacy campaign here, you know? 
I mean, forget it. Look at the imagination of, of say, Castro, the movement of the pencils. The movements of the alphabetization, the movement of the pencils. You know, we had nothing like this here. You know? Yeah. I mean, I go back to the wire again. The most dangerous person in the United States is a Negro with a, uh, with a, with a you know, however you want to take that, that noun, collective noun, you know, is w with a library card. This is what this Letters. culture wants to do, Real is Letters. deny the, li the library card. Mm -hmm. This has been a constant in the United States. That's why it's so anti-intellectual. It's so, you know, anti, you know, in a way. So for all of her, you know, I mean, there are many great qualities in her thinking. I don't really think she saw, you know, what the real problem was about Johnny can't read, you know, <laughs> because the teachers couldn't read, <laughs> you know, in some ways. We're witnessing now, listen, I'm getting college students now who basically I'm doing the work of a seventh grade teacher right. in terms of the editing. It's unbelievable to my mind. Why? And I, I go to the sub, quote superiors and talk in the union, we should be paid triple. We're doing the high school teachers, <laughs> the, the elementary school job, the high school job, and our own job here. You know, in, in, certain level, in can. terms of, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, th this is a very real, real question. And I mean, th this is anxiety producing to go back to the theme, you know, uh, you know, in a different way. But nobody cares as long as the paycheck comes. That's that's really part of the but part of the problem. To compete with the, what, uh, what the unions are doing too. With I mean, the cell phone with all due respect to DC thirty seven and uh, the UFT and the AFT and all these other organizations. I mean, all they care about are wages, and you know, yeah, and benefits. Okay. And, and, and not what, wages and benefits that reflect this. Right. What matters. Okay. Yeah, what matters. Real, real wages. Cost of living. They're going to go by the Bureau of Labor Statistics? Right. Give right. me a break. Right. Okay. You're better off with Trump and economics in this case. But yeah. that, that's, that's where right. I was shrugging my shoulders in, yeah. in the reference to yeah. Rousseau. Yeah. Because just this belief in a contract, which we do have with unions, and as a union member that yeah. has just, uh, you know, ties your hands and feet, um, and also her, her recognition that the industry of creating constitutions after the world wars, you know, for the, for the nation states as they've come up, is, is still, it's embedded in this, in the belief of the constitution, which we still have here in the United States. But I look like I'm losing, I'm, I'm losing the, uh, your, well, the understanding. The, 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 it's, it's, yeah. but contract theory, yeah. to, to say you have a contract and now you have Donald, Donald Trump really pushing that constitution or contract to its limits. He can't shut down the government, but he can. Or he can't do this and he, you know, it, it's, well, it's a, a... I mean, the social contract, according to Rousseau, cannot be based on, number one, the family. And the reason why it can't be based on the family, even though it's the oldest, quote, institution, you know, in some ways, is because once the child grows up and is able to achieve some independence, the authority is lost. Mm -hmm. You don't want a contract where there's no authority cannot be built on slavery because you may be born a slave, but the second, you know, you're, 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 mm -hmm. you're, you're, you know, it's made. And he goes through the Aristotelian, you know, that Aristotle was used to justify slavery. Some are slaves by nature, became in the 16th century an argument for the justification of slavery. This went on in Italy, Saronarola, Right during the time of Machiavelli, this was going on in Europe all the time. Some are slaves by nature. What the hell does this mean? You know, what does nature mean? What does by nature mean? Et cetera, right? Right, so but it can't be built on slavery and it can't be based on quote unquote moral authority because might does not make right. Mm -hmm. So what he builds the social contract is the notion of the people. Right? This is a, a very different notion, right, in a sense. But in that process, one has to go through the alienation of one's freedom. Right? Right? You give up a certain amount of property and freedom in order to become part of a larger collective, right? Which then may guarantee your freedom at a higher level. And this was the origin of the social contract. And you're always working through the sovereign, the general will, and the people. Obviously, the general will is never expressed in the United States. You know, as Gil Scott Heron said, you know, and it's even worse today, mandate my ass, 26% put in, you know, move from Skippy peanut butter, peanut uh, president, to, to uh, Ronald Reagan, mm -hmm. right? Right? And, you know, in, in a sense. So the general will is not really reflected in the electoral 
processes, right? So in a way, I don't think this is so much against the, the Rousseauian notion of the gen, you know, the movement of the general will with the sovereign and the and the people, you know. I mean, you know, in a way, uh, Rousseau is a stepping stone in some senses to you know, uh, you know, thinking through. Uh, alienation at the level of society, right? In 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 some ways, but anyway, I mean, I'm, I'm open to the discussion. You know, yeah, I mean, I'm open to the <laughs> the, the, the the discussion about this because R Rousseau is very important for today because this whole notion, these notions that social democracy, that AOC, you know, and whoever else, Bernie Sanders, all these people are speaking out of the you know, in some ways, very diluted Rousseauianism, right? Very diluted Enlightenment, you know, values of human rights, right? And in, in, in many ways, even though we had, you know, the welfare state that is now obviously the corporate. Well, this is another thing that the age of anxiety has produced. You know, the New Deal is over with. You know, by the time Truman comes to power, right. it's the fair already, deal. Already, right. <laughs> the fair deal and the yeah, Truman it's Doctrine, right? It's diluted and diluted the welfare state. And, you know, it's not until the great society when the cities are burning, or possible burning of the cities, right. that you begin to have a, a, a notion of, of, uh, of um, you know, uh, another right, the right to health care. And that's only for the old people and the poor, you know, so-called, you know, the poor. Right, the Medicaid. Those are the two victories of labor in the 20th century, in my opinion. Yeah, Social Security in the 30s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and Medicare, Medicaid in the in the early 60s, and then of course you know anti discrimination law, which you know in a lot of ways is is never really fulfilled its promise. You know, mm -hmm. it's and and it becomes distorted as as time goes on. So I mean I I I mean listen again I'm I'm all for Hannah Arendt and I'm, I'm going off on you know a tangent here with uh, Rousseau but but uh, I think I think it's important to keep in mind that you know the French view of human rights is very different right. than it's the American rights right. and in a way and you know since he's going to talk about individuality and individualism I think this is good to keep in mind here because he's not going to talk about the individual as we know only in America, yeah. right? <laughs> in, in a sense, you know, he's going to talk about this in a different way. Okay, okay let me let me go through yeah. just a couple more, and we'll go, we'll come back to it. Okay, yeah. just the, the last yeah, rejoinder, yeah, well, my apologies. Yeah, no, it's no rejoinder, no, but, it's okay, but, no apologies but, necessary. But, yeah. to, but to live as a U.S. citizen with a president who refers to Africa, Haiti as shitholes, yeah, right, right, right. Um, yeah. the notion of equality in the in the minds of the leaders is something that well as far as I'm concerned that's still white supremacists yes. running the okay. show so which were the we, framers of the yeah. Constitution you yeah. said so uh -huh. yourself yeah. Yeah. The, for the peers right yeah. I mean that comes full circle mm -hmm. it's like as it, if the second right. Constitution of 1865 was never written mm -hmm. right I mean this is an, the another, Constitution yeah. had yeah. Our Constitution. slavery baked into yeah. it right Yes. It was minimally right. democratic. Right. It was right. plutocratic Which, and oligarchic from right. the beginning. Right. Only only properly yes. qualified white males were mm -hmm. involved. Not even a poor white male, let alone well, women, African Americans. Went to the same spa that Richard Wright went to. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> in Saratoga Springs. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> I had to throw that in. I mean, so, so we can move on a little bit. Yeah, no, we know it's all. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, look, the, 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 the problem today is, is that we live in an oligarchic democracy. Yes. And that's democracy yes. is the noble lie of yes. our time. That's this right. is the platonic noble lie of our time. Right. But somehow if you vote and if electoral processes, mm -hmm. you're actually going to have some <laughs> representation. Give me a break. You have none. Right, right, in a sense. Right? The oligarchic democracy. Democracy becomes the noble lie. I mean, you Thank know, in you. so many ways. That's what I'm, I'm trying to I'm not saying say, it's yeah. only the just the one percent in a sense. I'm talking about how the system, when I say Leonard Cohen says the rich have their channels in the bedrooms of the poor, this is the ideological warfare that's mm -hmm. going on. We don't have... We don't have, uh, you know, we, we really, unfortunately, we don't have Afro-American heroes in terms of surgeons, lawyers, you know, it's always, always sports and entertainment. Right. Still, right. after all these years, all this education, we don't hold up these people, right? In a way, I can go into a room mm -hmm. and I'll have 20 Afro-American students and, and nobody's going to know who Cornell West is. Mm -hmm. This is sad. This is very sad. 
you know, in, and in many women, ways. Women and I'm not talking, I mean, yeah, yeah. they know who he is at Princeton, but who goes to Princeton? <laughs> we saw the statistics in, in the high schools in, in, in New York City. Two boys. Six percent, six percent Afro-Americans at Stuyvesant. Five, six percent at uh, Bronx Science, right? We saw all these statistics. Seven, 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 seven yeah, seven, seven, seven out of a a over a thousand, right? Right. It's unbelievable. So you know, this this is what we're 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 doing. So with all due respect, again to Hannah Arendt and to the Greek polis, which you know, I mean, is magnificent <laughs> for the fifth century BCE. And even Karl Marx says we still act like children when we see what this civilization produced. He says this in the Grundrisse. That was then, and now is now. And some ways, you know, uh, you know, what elements could you take out of that? Yes, it's true. In terms of direct democracy, you might go back to a Deems model. You can talk about Clasisthenes. You can talk about uh, Solon in terms of reallotment of lands, different types of direct democracy. Who's being, yeah, etc. Right? The police are slaves in Greece. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I mean that's a good or thing, or <laughs> <laughs> in my opinion. Make them, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I'm just you know, but they are during Aristotle. And, or, 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 Get that car for me. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. I'm sorry. All yeah. the police were slaves. Well, yeah. I mean, you, you read Aristotle carefully. Yeah, you go back and reconstruct that era. Yes, that's what's happening. Yeah, it took a lot to be a citizen. That's another thing, too. And nothing but a fucking pleb, I heard with my own ears, a policeman referred to in England by whoever it was about five, six years ago. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah. Police yeah, still here is slaves, too. Yes. Well, yes, of course. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm not denying that. I'm just saying the literal. The glory uh, that was they were called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The glory that was Greece and the grandeur that was Rome. All I remember the metaphor. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> of course. Yeah, well, this, this is built on another kind of uh, slave economy. <laughs> you know, we have to redefine <laughs> what a willing slave. All right. Anyway, uh, let me just let me just uh, mention a couple of things here. Um, the um, Rousseau really set it off, huh? Good, good for Jean Sorry. Jacques. Okay. I just shook my Once again, <laughs> right, right, right. Um, um, chapter four. Let's let's go down to page seventeen. Um, um, globalized. Yeah, globalized uh, world, the increasing transnational mobility of people, the opening up of borders and the widespread dominance of capitalist forms of social organization have engendered decisive displacement in the terms used for understanding collective <coughs> identity. Against these erratic, fluctuating, hybrid social embodiments, the dominant discourse will need to venture into unfamiliar interpretive territory if it wants to imagine a new its structural prescriptions. The rigorous distinction between private and public spheres will be relativized, and the relationships between political and financial powers will be redesigned. We have that going on right now. Look at this guy from Texas, Beto uh, Aurora, you know? I mean, you know, right away, like this. He went to the right schools, from Houston, up, you know, et cetera. He comes you know. from wealth, too. Yeah, no, of course. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. River Oaks. Yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right away. Calls up his friends. You know, I mean, you know, this is not, you know, Bernie Sanders, give me $27 or pledge three <laughs> or seven to seven. You know, he's calling up. You got an extra half a million? You know, uh, oil rich people, et cetera. He has so, Obama's bundler. Yes. That's oh, right. I like Elizabeth Warren. She's okay. Yeah, okay. I'm real glad. Yeah. She says there's nothing wrong with capitalism, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Even she. Yeah, even she. Right. Yeah. Pocahontas, huh? That's what the, the nasty term was. Right? 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 Yeah, she blew it, though. I mean, think about this. How, how they get, I mean, how much That's they, how, they how, how Trump, how, you know, yeah. in his stupidity, Take how clever he is, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. in some ways. I mean, it's, 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 it's amazing. He's dumb like a fox. Yeah, yeah, well, I don't know. Yeah. Even a broken clock is yeah. right twice. Yeah, indeed, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> Right. right. So anyway, um, um, the um, 
national cultures can no longer pose as unquestionable, overarching, and inalienable collective values. Power structures will have to invent increasingly imaginative ways to handle unpredictability and uncertainty, contain randomness, and deal with precariousness and impermanence. This is new in this age of anxiety. We did not have the structural unemployment problems when Auden is writing his things. We did not have a precarious you know, we're more you. Uh, you know, uh, 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 labor force at that point. We do not, do not uh, back then. Today, nothing but precarity. You know, in many ways, nothing but. Yeah, yeah. The conditions for wedding reality's functional and organizational aspects to its symbolic substance must shift, and the struggle against entropic forces will take place el elsewhere. The need for social reproduction will move in new directions, and the demand for cohesion will be invested with a new ideological and political terminology. I know it's getting late. Okay. I the mean, uh, <laughs> forms of signature. Sig I mean, I'm looking at, yeah, page 18. What? We don't all have it because Josh only could put only put the introduction. Oh, we only put the introduction. Yeah, I so see. So only the yeah. book. Okay. So, so anyway, what I would do for next week, okay, okay again, we we're going to do the age of, yeah, this class will be uh, chapters two through four okay, this of this book. book. Yeah, two through four. He gets into it. I think four, four. when you begin to get to four, and I want to just say, Chukalas wrote a piece and um, um, I know it well because I edited some of it. It's not a great editing job, but anyway, it, it's called the Deregulation of Morals. If you go to the Institute for Radical Imagination website, let me put this on the, the board, radicalimagination.institute, you can go to Situations, the journal, and you can download it. This. That's the website, and you'll see on the top, um, Situations Journal, right, on the on one of the top, and you scroll down, and this is, let me see, Al, I need the volume yeah, number, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's uh, volume uh, four, number two, uh, spring 2012. It has the piece, The Deregulation of Morals. This was a good issue. I mean, I have copies of it, but I'm not going to carry you know, 10, 15, I brought the, we'll bring the age of anxiety next week. But you can get it online. It's called the deregulation of morals, the pen, the ultimate uh, phase of globalization. That's the first one. The it's first. the first essay in this one. This is a good issue because it has uh, uh, the coming insurrection, this group in France that we uh, did a panel on and some of the pieces from that. I wrote the three-page uh, introduction to the panel, and uh, Jeremy Glick's got a pretty good thing on aphoristic lines of flights in here. But anyway, it's a good issue, but the Chukalos is interesting because he really begins to see things in terms of globalization. Mm -hmm. and, and this length, you know, and that the age of anxiety is no longer just in terms of the national proper or the split world. It's a unitary globalization, maybe with class fractions, playing out, right? You know, you have a Pacific ruling class, you have an a, a, a Atlantic ruling class, et cetera, but it's a very different set of parameters now as we go go forward. So he, he really speaks to this in this thing on the age of financialization, the derivatives markets, all of these kind of things. A very, very good piece that may enhance the reading of this. This is a book, as far as I can tell, is a book of it's a symptomatology. It's where we are. It's not totally prescriptive. I mean, I think there are hints and prescription, but it's mostly a, a, a the symptomatology on the above descriptive and analytic levels. Right? Okay. So yeah. All right. So we'll um, you know you, uh, experience you, our you good anxiety. Yeah, I did because I would.